Uh, good morning and welcome, or good morning, afternoon, or evening, I should say. Welcome, everyone, and Happy New Year. Uh, this is the Citizens for Global Solutions Virtual Book Club. Uh, today is Saturday, January 14th. I'm Bob Flax, our Executive Director, and we are joined by Gail Hughes, who's our Book Club Coordinator, and Drea Bergman-Klein, who's our Programs and Campaigns Manager, and they really do all the heavy lifting behind the scenes to make sure all this works. I just come in you know, play MC for the uh, hour and a half. So today's our final session, uh, Reading Union Now by Clarence Streit. Uh, and we are pleased once again to have Tiziana Stella, who's the executive director of the Streit Council, join us to focus on chapters 11 through 13 and the appendices. So the, the remainder of the book. Um, I should say that um, Tiziana, has had some internet problems over the last few days. So we're not gonna go ahead um, with the PowerPoint as we often do. That seems to be uh, kind of pushing the, the problem over the edge. Um, so we were just troubleshooting with her. She's off right now. She should be back in in a moment on the phone and she'll just participate in the conversation uh, as we had done last time without a PowerPoint, but this time we'll have her um, join us. So uh, during that point, again, I ask everyone to go on mute so we don't hear all the, the background noises and the, you know, the dogs barking and all that stuff. And uh, free, feel free to use the chat if you wanna communicate with each other, uh, but we will not be monitoring that. So if there's anything, a question that you wanna ask or whatever, when, when we get to that point, um, you uh, would need to raise your cyber hand and ask it rather than put it in the chat. Um, also, if um, folks come on later on in, in the session and we don't recognize their name or phone number or whatever, uh, I, we will stop the proceedings and check in with them to see who they are in order to present the, prevent Zoom bombing, hacking, or anything like that. And as usual, we'll stop about 10 minutes before um, in order to, um, if anyone has any uh, announcements, if they're promoting anything, books, events, whatever, uh, you'll get a chance to do that. So we ask you to hold that uh, till the end. And I also want to um, leave you with uh, two questions to think about in the back of your mind as we're having the session, um, which is one is um, where, you know, we, we plan to start the next book after this. And often we've had a month long break uh, to allow people to get the book and start reading it and all that. Um, but this next book is available um, on the web and you already, uh, Gail, Gail sent you the link for that. Um, so there's no time required to go find it. Um, so we were thinking of rolling right in to the, um, uh, to the next one next month rather than taking the month off. Uh, we actually skipped the month when we had our annual meeting uh, so um, we'd like to, to stay on our schedule, which we've told all the authors, we'd like to roll into it uh, next, next month. Um, and, and along with that kind of similar thing is, um, as you may recall, last month, uh, Tiziana um, was heading to Europe when we had our last session, so she couldn't join us. Um, so we had a discussion without her. And um, that turned out to be so fruitful and we could bring up things that weren't specifically focused on the book, uh, but other related topics that we thought um, afterward, the, the, the team was talking and thought it might be helpful um, to have a session um, at the end of the regular sessions without the speaker. So we can reflect on the book and all other related things and action plans, stuff we might do um, and all that. So if we do that, there are two ways we could do that and still keep our two books a year framework. Uh, one is we could just get rid of the breaks and have our usual five sessions with the author and then have the sixth session without the author, but just among ourselves, and then just go into the next book. And obviously that session, like all of them are voluntary, no one you know, you know, is for, forced to come and they will be recorded so you can see them later if you want. So that would have the book club go 12 months a year, the five with the author and the one without the author where we're meeting anyway. Right? 
The other way to do that, if people still want a break, we can, instead of reading the book in five months with the author, we could read it in four months, which may be very feasible with some books, maybe a little more challenging with others, and then have the fifth month be alone without the author, just ourselves, and then the sixth month still have the break and then go into the next half year cycle. So those are kind of logistically the two ways we could manage it. And what I'd like to do is check back with you at the end uh, to ask if, there, if there's a uh, kind of obvious strong presence, we may not even need to do a, you know, an uh, email vote. Um, but if it looks like there's folks in each camp, then we could do the, uh, we can check on email later on. So, uh, so that's just something to let percolate in the back of your, in the back of your mind. Um, I will say in the last 25 seconds, the sky has opened up outside my, my window. So yeah, when that monsoon season has once again uh, returned. So, um, so this, okay, so those are all the logistics I have at this point. I would turn it over to Tiziana. Uh, since she's not yet plugged back in, maybe she's having an issue with the phone. Uh, we could start nevertheless with the conversation, um, starting with chapter 11. Um, and first I'll, I'll open the floor if anyone has any questions or comments or anything they want to kick off with regarding ch chapter 11. And if not, I have something. And chapter 11, if you uh, need a moment to find it, uh, is on page 150, at least of the edition that I have, which I think is the shorter edition. And the title of the chapter is Of Time and Union. Yes, Gail, and you're on mute. Well, I was struck by um, a statement in on page 140. You cannot sow government of the state by the state and for the state and not reap it. You cannot possibly place the sovereignty of the nation above the sovereignty of man without strengthening the nation at the expense of the citizen. I thought that was interesting and of course that's the situation we're in right now where we have sovereignty of nations and i you know probably most people think that's great but does that imply then that nations have more power and more legitimacy than individuals that's that's what he's claiming and that's that's um something to think about yeah Actually, my, my comment was was related to that, but let me see. Anybody else have anything on that point? Okay, well, then, then I'll, I'll just um, raise the thing that I wanted to, which, and I think I may have mentioned this last time, but, you know, usually in, in the, um, the kind of criticisms to World Federation um, that we hear, people say and think that if the nations are giving up some sovereignty and freedom or whatever, so are we, the individual, you know, that if the nation loses out, we lose out. But, but uh, Streit seems to kind of turn that on its head and says, no, no, no. If the, the nation gives up some sovereignty, we individuals gain more power and more freedom. And I've never kind of heard it put that way. You know, which is, I think, just an, a di another way of saying what you just said, Gail. Um, so I wonder, you know, I was, I was going to ask, and, and will, as soon as Tiziana gets back on, um, I will ask her to speak to that. Um, but I'm wondering, if, did, did that strike anyone else, or does anyone have anything to say about that? And I would think I, I usually don't call on people, but but David, given the work that you do, um, David Gallup, uh, I, I would think that um, that you might have some a perspective on that, or maybe just agree with it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I think I mentioned in our last meeting uh, about the book that I was struck by the focus on the individual uh, that Stripe placed in, in the book. I mean, I have, I have the actual book, but I've also have a, have it on my iPad so I can, uh -huh. I can mark, you know, with like uh, big asterisks and stuff. Cause I don't, I, this is such a historic book. I don't want to write in that. Yeah. Yeah. 
So there were every time where he talks about the individual and, and promoting the individual and, and will it help us, uh, I was marking because, and there's some great quotes that I think uh, CGS could use, whether it's on our website or in our materials from, from Stripe. And of course, from the, I guess if you're what you're sort of focused, trying to focus me on, Bob is, is maybe like the world citizenship aspect, since that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is uh, a point that every individual has rights and duties. And the, the best way to secure those rights and duties is if individuals themselves can participate in government fully, and that it's government of, by, and for us, the people, and not us for the government. So yeah, I mean, uh, Dre and I were talking yesterday, and this maybe go, go, this is something I think we should talk about later, but the um, also kind of powerful uh, similarities of what uh, Stride is talking about, uh, the impact of both on individuals and just on society in general, uh, the similarities of what he's writing about in 1937, 38, to right now, it's really scary, <laughs> actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we should later on, maybe as we get into one of the later chapters, uh, or even at the end, talk about how is how is the UN, uh, which is focused on the nations, really not on us, the people. How is that like the League of Nations, uh, and and what can we do about that versus getting to a, a world union? So yeah, I mean, so yes, in the end, Bob, I guess, from a world citizenship uh, perspective, and even from, and I mentioned this also last time, uh, and Ron, when Ron Glossop was here, his book, uh, World Federation, uh, also talked about the, that the individual is really the ultimate goal of, of a democratic world federal government, that we participate, whether it's uh, through representatives in a world parliament or that we we participate ourselves and in, in even on vote, in voting on uh, world governmental or uh, issues that impact us locally. Yeah. Other, yes, uh, Lee, and you're on mute. Well, I, I don't know if we can jump around in chapters, but um, in chapter 13, um, the author says that nationalism only began in the 19th century and that it was positive early on but now it's outused its usefulness. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, 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 the nation has freedom, but the individual doesn't. And so um, that's related, I think, his, his yeah. discussion of that is related. Yeah, yeah, different chapter, but same idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, 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 the, the conversation is reminding me um, a couple of years back when the Brexit thing was, you know, when, Britain was debating and all. Um, there was a WFM meeting in Brussels that I attended. And um, from that meeting, I went to, uh, with Andreas, when the meeting was over, I went to Andreas's house in Germany uh, and stayed in Germany with him for about a week or part of a week or whatever. And I remember asking him as we were on the train going, you know, crossing borders without any problem, you know, I said, you know, what, what, what's up with this Brexit thing? I mean, is the EU falling apart? And this, you know, this is what we hear in the United States. It's, it's coming to an end, you know? And he just looked at me and rolled his eyes, you know? And, and he said, that's just sensationalist garbage that, you know, that no one, I mean, he said, just look at the trip we did. We would have to stop at each border, go through customs for hours, change currency, uh, do this, be detained, you know? Nobody wants that, you know, he said, nobody in Europe wants that, you know, they don't, and that's just a small example, you know, so, so that, that kind of reminds me, I mean, I, you know, in, in these federations, you have more rights, even as simple as the right to travel, you know, the right not to be detained, not to have to be hassled with currency exchange, you know, on and on and on. And that was just kind of a small example of this. Um, so, you know, applying that to the world, it just seems like, uh, obvious once you, you, you're you introduced to that idea. Um, so anyway, want to throw that in the soup. I see Drea. Well, I was just going to say the same point, Bob, because what struck me in this chapter, he's talking about Europe, right? And this line that the quote, you know, Europe seems incapable of becoming the home of free states and versus what Europe is now today and having lived there, <laughs> you know, for my master's, I could travel anywhere 
I didn't lose money in the exchange. We did have more individual rights and our human rights were more protected because it wasn't just the, the country you were living in. You were also a part of the EU where you had these extra protections through the through the EU. So um, I, I just that's what kind of struck me in this chapter was, you know, this comparison between the United States and Europe and how Europe doesn't. <laughs> you know, is not not an ally and why. And then I'm thinking about how we've just completely reversed course. <laughs> um, and anyways, that was, yeah, I did have more freedoms and rights uh, in, in Europe with the EU than any other place I've been to. Cool. Gail? And you're on mute, Gail. Yeah, that, and, and related to that is a broader issue of borders. And um, I thought his comment there was interesting where he said, why should people think it would be any more complicated to allow people to go to travel wherever they want to in the world than within a country? You know, we're not concerned about people moving or traveling from one state to another within the US. We're only concerned about people moving from Mexico or <laughs> Canada. <laughs> You know, and, but that if borders were all free, um, you know, things would balance out is is his argument. Yeah. And I thought that was that was interesting. Cool. Any other comments or what observations about this point? Okay, well, I do think um, actually kind of following in line with what Lee introduced before, that staying with the points rather than the chapters may be uh, more fruitful because some of them cut across the chapters. So let me um, introduce another one then. Um, this is the, um, in, in my book, in, in my edition, it's right after the, ph the philosophy uh, section. And um, there was one sentence in there that really seemed very ominous, but also very accurate. I mean, he just like pulls no punches, this guy. So the sentence is, he says, we have now reached a stage in the growth of civilization, which cannot go further and is doomed to go back on, until we discover the means of passing from the national to the international state. I'll just say that again. We have now reached a stage in the growth of civilization, which cannot go further and is doomed to go back or backwards, I guess he meant until we discover a means of passing from the national to the international state. So- um, What page is that on, Bob? In, in the one, I think it's the same one you have, the historic one there, that's page, um, da, da, da. What, well, it's got, it's got no number on it, but it's, bef it's the page before 169. One, right before 169, there's a, quote from H.G. Wells on top, and that's the, and then what I read is the second sentence under the H.G. Wells quote. Yeah, it's part of a thing from uh, the Commonwealth of God, um, whoever, uh, yeah, Lionel Curtis, a quote from him. So he kind of, you know, just lays it on the line there that un unless we make the jump to the next stage, we're just gonna backslide and it's gonna get worse and worse. Someone um, uh, talking about the, um, uh, okay, no, uh, different point. I, I'll, I'll bring that, I'll retract that. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about that. I mean, did, are we doomed unless we make the jump? I mean, have we reached the, uh, the cancer state of nationalism? And unless we, we break out of it, it's just going to get worse and worse. Um, yeah, yeah, Simon? How is this uh, related to a world authority, which we, we lack at the present time? Well, I mean, it's directly we would, related. We would, we would have, hopefully, again, more, more freedom and more power. In right. The... Yeah, no, I mean, what, 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 what that quote that I just read is saying, if we don't do that, if we don't have a world authority, this is where we're headed, where we can't advance anymore. We're just going to go backward. Um, and certainly, 
the um, you know <laughs> the the evidence seems to bear that out. Um, yes. And, in fact, he said another thing here. Oh, Lee, okay, Lee, go, go ahead. Well, I, I'm thinking about, about countries or nations that are currently now uh, sort of breaking up. Um, within our country, we, we're pulling apart. The Republicans and the Democrats are really pulling apart. And, and that appears to be happening in many countries at this point. There is, there is a lot of dissension within the country. And if that's not going backwards, I don't know what it is. Hmm. Yep, more, more, yet, yet more evidence on the pile, for sure. Yeah, another point, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's related, but it also struck out uh, or stood out uh, to me. I think it was in chapter uh, 12, where he says that people often say, um, or, or the leaders of autocracies, uh, especially these days China, um, you know, is, says that they're more effective now. They're more responsive. They could respond to crises better than democracies. And you know, and, and he makes the case here that they say that, uh, and certainly China is, is now explicitly saying that, that democracy is antiquated, we're beyond it, et cetera, et cetera. But the point Streit makes is yes, they may be more responsive, but they're not more responsive following the will of the people. They're more responsive following the dictator, <laughs> you know? It's like, duh, you know? So to say they're more responsive is kind of a half truth. Yeah, they, they could, you know, respond in an hour, you know, or, uh, you know, on an impulse. Uh, but it's only one person responding, you know, and forcing the nation rather than the nation responding, which by nature is a deliberative process. So that also seemed like a, um, uh, an argument against World Federation that's very easy to turn on its head, you know. Let me just uh, take a break since Barat just joined us and let him know what's, what's going on. Um, first, hi, Happy New Year, uh, <laughs> Barat. Um, the uh, Tiziano is having some internet problems. So um, we came up with a plan that rather than do a um, PowerPoint, she was gonna join us by phone. Uh, she was actually with us at the very beginning and she went off and hasn't come back on. So it looks like that problem is persisting, but we're continuing the discussion uh, nonetheless. So just to let you know what's happening and hopefully she'll get a chance to join us before the session is over. Um, so back to what, um, what we were talking about, any, any other thoughts or comments on any of those points? Or anything else that jumped out at people? Yes, Gail. Well, it depends on how individuals are represented. I mean, if there is direct democracy, which now the internet actually might provide an option of, of having, you know, and that of course wasn't discussed in his book because that hadn't been invented yet, but you know, that's something that we could consider. But if there's representation in, of, in any way, be it by states or, you know, localities somehow or regions, then the issue is, well, how will individuals be represented? Mm -hmm. And that's the problem because um, people in different groups or regions, or, you know, they do have different needs and interests. So those need to be taken into account. And yet, um, if there are representatives, they need to both represent their con constituencies but they also need to be statesmen, or statespeople in, in my mm -hmm. mind, first and foremost, to address the global problems and issues. Otherwise, that's what we have now. You know, that's, that's may, maybe the major problem is we don't have anyone actually looking at global issues or problems because they're all, they all have their own local agendas. So actually, this is a very, ineffective way of dealing with, even though we've got global organizations 
they're not really global dealing with global problems effectively because of that, in my estimation. Right. Other comments on that point? Well, I'll just add that, um, I mean, first, yes, to what, what, what you just said. Um, and I, I also see how tricky it, it would be, because I mean, if, if we- it could be elect, The problem could be solved instantly, if, um, if there be a shift to say, rather than continuing the geopolitical- okay. um, Excuse me a moment. Um, if we, um, um, what was I gonna say? Um, when we uh, elect people to the Congress, um, you know, we're electing them to look at the interests of our, um, our region, our area. Um, but when we um, elect people to the global parliament, um, the idea is that these people are supposed to first have in mind the, um, you know, what, what's better for humanity. I mean, I, I, I assume that's the idea. Um, you know, what is, what's better for humanity. And that's going to be a real trick uh, in terms of, um, you know, of having someone that comes from a particular ge geographical area thinking in terms of what's better for humanity as opposed to their provincial area. So, um, so anyhow. Um, Any other comments? And I think Lynn, you were wanting to say something? No. Oh, okay, great. Thanks um, for asking though. All right, I'm sorry. I, 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 you, you appeared and I heard a voice at the same time and I didn't know if it was you or not. So, um, but okay. So if it's not that, that's fine. Thanks, yeah. Okay, that's so, um, so was there anyone who was trying to talk before who didn't? Okay, I thought I heard a woman's voice. Okay, uh, David? Sure, well, so there's two things that I wanted to mention, uh, and then we could take them separately, or I could say one, see if there's any comments, and then say the other, okay. whatever. The first one though is I, I, I had never heard this before, uh, but that the word friend and freedom come from the same etymological uh, root of being like, beloved or, or love or having like a kinship. So I think that's so cool to, and I, maybe I'll write a blog about it, but about how, you know, by, by being friends, uh, we have more freedom. So the more we come together as, as one, one humanity, one people, uh, the more freedom we'll have. I mean, that's that whole chapter about freedom and union, I think was, that was sort of the uh, ultimate goal of, of, mm. Of that point, but I, I love, I love, I love the fact that they come from the same root. Cool. And you had a second thing. Well, well Drea has a comment. So oh, I'll... oh, I'm... okay. Uh, no, just to speak after you. You go ahead with your second. Sorry, I'll lower my uh, hand. <laughs> uh, okay. So the other comment was really more, and this is why I wish um, Tiziana were here with us because she might know, or unless anybody else knows. But really, I was sort of surprised how he brought in religion uh, near the end of the book, bringing in the, the different prophets and why, you know, try to rack my brain as to why he would do that was, I mean, and I, he told the story of Cain and Abel, but also of Muhammad and, and all. Um, I just, you know, and just as a reader, I'm like, why, why is he doing this? Is it, is it making his argument stronger or is he trying to appeal to a different segment of society uh, by doing so, and, and does it make his argument stronger? And I, you know, I didn't really have a final conclusion. I have to think about that some more to see whether it really does that, at least for me. But I was just kind of wondering if anyone knew why, why historically, is it that time in 1938 or something, uh, or over the 20s and 30s when he was thinking about this and writing this, that that, that would be an important uh argument to bring in you know I don't know whether a lot of you know whether historians or political writers felt the need to bring in religion um, in making their arguments great thank you I see Shirley's got uh, or Lee I should say I'm sorry well I read that section particularly um, and and felt that he was building up um, a historical trend that he saw in humanity and so 
he in each of the steps from Cain and Abel and the cynics and Jesus and Muhammad, he was showing how he thought people were more and more and more uniting. And that these were people who were promoting the unification of people. That's how I saw it. Hmm. Okay. And uh, David Orton and uh, David Simon and Brad. And I think his point also is that those religious people were visionaries, that they didn't accept the status quo, mm. that they imagined a, a different kind of future where there would be unity, peace, and justice. So they had a vision. Right. Terrific. Thank you, Simon and then Barat. Um, uh, unfortunately, that may be the uh, theory for each religion for each religion to be united. But when it comes to different religions, they are unfortunately not united. Uh, the evidence, look at the Holocaust. There was Christianity and Judaism. You got the Armenian genocide. There was Muslim and Christian. So that we have to resolve somehow also. Uh, I belong to the Interreligious Council of Southern California, for example, of 12, 13, world religions and uh, you know again we talk but we don't feel, seem to have the power to bring about a world you know religious unity uh, and 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 harmony and peace and justice uh, so religion can be uniting for the people who belong to that religion but could be divisive uh, to different religions we have to resolve that problem unfortunately Thank you. Good point. Thank you, Barat. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry I, I joined late, but uh, because of that, uh, while what I'm hearing is interesting, but I'm not sure what it is that we are talking about. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if I may, at the expense of uh, uh, kind of breaking the flow. Uh, can can I can you just say what is it? That well, yeah. Let, let me. Is it what would, what would, or is it a, some thought that we are exploring, or yeah, or what, some what comments? Would you, yeah. What we what we what we um, just kind of naturally evolved into doing is that um, people mention things that grab them about the reading in those three chapters, and then once that topic or that theme is put out then we just open the floor to anyone to respond to that topic or theme. So we've been kind of going in an organic way rather than a more presentational structured way. So, um, so that's what you stepped in, into the middle of. Um, you know, someone just raising an issue that grabbed them and then we run with the ball until it looks like we've run as much as we, we can with that and then go to the next one. So, so it's not something that comes out of the discussion of the book is it uh, oh no it's from it, 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 it's stuff it's stuff either very directly related to the book or things that the book may have reminded us of or uh triggered an associated thought but it's all grounded in the last three chapters yeah i'm i'm revealing my uh, uh myself by because i've been kind of absent and so for some time and so i'm uh, not up to date on the book. So oh, okay. Well, th then yes. So, th so then the stuff might seem foreign if you haven't read those last three chapters. So, but but yeah. that is what we're doing, okay. just okay. to let you know the process. Yeah. But thank you, thank you. Sure, sure. No, we're we're spinning out of the last three chapters. <laughs> so, um, any other um, themes to um, to riff on? Well, I. Um... <laughs> I have some and then I saw David Orton's hand. Yeah, yeah, I have some some criticisms. I really, really, really struggled with the uh, the last chapters. Uh, the racism, the the what seems to be like a pro colonial stance is really, really hard. Like it stuck mm. so much that for the rest of the remaining chapter. Uh, I wasn't really reading and paying attention because I was just so enraged. <laughs> um, and then, you know, not, you know, there's just it seems to be this like, 
putting Rome as the ultimate civilization on a on a pedestal when Rome was just a colonizer and brutal and um, the horrible racist things that he said against indigenous people and you know Jews and Turks and others. It was it just was I couldn't move beyond that. And then he also puts all of the founding fathers on a pedestal when they were all slave owners. <laughs> so I just keep thinking like if, if and in, in, it's not just that it was this time we have to, you know, give them a pass because there were a lot of anti-racist and anti-colonial folks in this space at this time. Um, but then what I worry about is like, if you don't, <laughs> If you have that mentality and you think we should have a, a union for the world, I think we're going to just fall into this same trap of, of the United Nations. You know, the people that were anti colonial, anti racist were pushed out of the forming of the UN intentionally. And so that's what kind of really struck me in this last chapter was, you know, if we're going to move forward with this and make progress, if this isn't front and center and acknowledging this brutal history, and acknowledging the harm that it continues to do, I don't know how we're going to move forward uh, with a world government. So that's what really just, I, I couldn't even read the appendix. I just, I was just enraged. So that was, that was my big takeaway uh, point it. from no, these last couple no, of chapters. Thank you, for, thank you for raising that. Let me just make a quick process comment for those who joined us late. Um, so what, what we'll do then is we'll see if there are other reactions to what Drea said uh, or, what, or when they read those sections. And then I have David Orton and Lynn in the queue uh, to bring, when we're done with, with this uh, theme, is to introduce the next ones that they want to. So, so let me open the floor uh, to anyone who wants to respond to this theme, and then we'll get to David Orton and Lynn. Uh, on whatever grabbed them in the reading. So responses to what Drea just raised. So Lynn, I see your hand still up. Did you want to respond to, to that? Um, yeah, I couldn't yeah. agree. I couldn't agree with you more, uh, Drea. Um, exactly. I've been, sorry that I'm coming in late and I haven't read the thing. And I've been at a Palestinian thing and then a Schiller Institute thing. Um, the Palestinian thing talked about um, let's see, it's this thing called Plan Dalet, which is the fourth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which was, which was just like what you were saying, um, um, Drea, the, uh, just the horrific, like, it's God that's making us do this, you know, and it's like, it's not about God. It's, you know, I'm Quaker, Jewish, Buddhist, Unitarian, you know. And and God is not a real estate agent. He didn't say Israel, Palestine, you know, like and the Palestinians have been there for 2000, 10,000 years. You know, like this is just um, unspeakable. And it just goes on and on and on. I agree. I agree. But how to change this? And and now another thing that's happening is the International Court of Justice and the International criminal court are vying back and forth with the Israeli government on the Supreme Court versus the Knesset, allowing the Knesset more latitude in, in these crazies like Ben Gavir that are on, on there now. So it's, I, I sometimes think, Drea and everyone, that sometimes things have to get worse before they get better. But I think that we've evolved beyond that. I don't think we have to blow ourselves into nuclear oblivion with a Ukraine Russia war, you know, for example, to get it. I'd rather not go there, you know? Right. So, right. what do we do? And I think the best solution, uh, I've always thought I worked for the World Federalist Association in 1976 when I was back visiting my dad in DC. And I've always believed in the United Nations until the United Nations, like, goes to the opposite extreme, backs up, like basically the assassination of Kennedy, which was the discussion with the Scheller Institute today, and the whole cabal behind everything and the whole setup, you know, and the new world order and all of this. And so I think that folks have to be really 
actively against what appears to be like the good. Um, and Citizens for Global Solution developed out of World Federalists. That's great. And it's like, let's go the extra measure and take it to the common good. And like you were saying, freedom is the same as friend, you know, uh, David, like totally. Yes, it is. And, and, and we can do, you know, and I think that's really important that we have a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know, that we say we're going to, if we have to go down in the nuclear annihilation, then I'd much rather go down knowing that I tried you know, yeah. and that we appealed to humanity, even to Hitler, even to Trump. Thank you, Lynn. And certainly we, we are looking to head it off at the pass and try to have something happen before World War III is upon us. Uh, but Gail, I see your hand up. You, you put yourself on mute instead of took yourself off. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Drea. And um, I had, I mean, my overall uh, comments about the book is that a major problem is that it was written in 1939 and at a time when, you know, Germany was, Germany and Italy and Japan were you know, aggressors, but he's making assumptions about these 15 countries being democracies. Well, for one thing, a lot of those democracies had been monarchies not very long before that had colonized a lot of the world. So, you know, it, and then my comment before was, he's assuming that these democracies will not ever be aggressors against non-democracies or against each other. And since World War II, historically, it's proven not to be the case. I mean, it's the US that has, um, you know, launched uh, incursions across the, the world, and, um, as well as Russia, you know, but I mean, he, Russia is not a democracy, but the U.S. is supposed to be, and yet the U.S. has launched various wars. So, yeah, I think the, <laughs> there are definitely flaws in, you can see the historical problems by um, his assumptions regarding his blindness to um, to racism and um, colonialism and, and so on. Right. Thank you. So any other thoughts on this point before we get to the next one? David Gallup, go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah, of course, I completely also agree, Drea. Uh, there are a lot of problems in in his presentation. He earlier on in the book, not not just the derogatory comments he makes against specific groups, but even more general, like he's looking down upon certain societies as not being um, intelligent enough almost is, is he doesn't maybe put it in those terms, but like they're baser. And so they they couldn't join the, the union immediately because they're not ready or something. And yeah, I, I found that pretty reprehensible. Um, I did keep reading. I mean, I studied history in college and I took a class on the, like sort of the creation of the Ottoman uh, Empire and it was amazing to see how how much good in like promotion of arts um, and language and other things that you know the Ottomans did, but then there was so much brutality uh, there too. Uh, you know, well, humans are brutal to each other, sadly. But uh, so I kind of felt like I have to take at least the parts that are good from this and and run with that, and not ignore. The, the bad parts, but to highlight them. And, and if we're going to ever share this book with anybody else, we would have to, you know, as an organization, we would have to, you know, put a caveat saying, well, we know that the, this is problematic and, and that in, a, in the democratic world federal union that we want, it wouldn't, you know, it would move completely away from the, the colonization and, and repression and oppression. I also, I mean, you know, he, he's, talking about which I didn't really appreciate the almost like the the capitalist is capitalism is is king or whatever and I, I didn't like that either I, I mean I, I feel like that's what's also destroying the planet right now is our uh, forever having to have growth and for companies to have to be able to produce for their shareholders and all and and so that's sort of what he's getting at about with trade and all in the end from the perspective maybe before 
there was as much, you know, information about, you know, climate change as there is now, obviously. But anyway, so I guess my point is that I would, you know, as a as a history major, I, I you know, I would have been, I, I would have put down a lot of books <laughs> um, as I was reading them, if I, you know, if by being um, repulsed by what I was reading, if I did, and if I hadn't continued to read. So I mean, I do feel like. And especially during the pandemic, it was so easy, or even prior, right prior, to be in a bubble and to just only listen to, you know, NPR and uh, uh, liberal viewpoints. And, and well, I never turn on Fox News, but maybe I should, uh, <laughs> because it, I think it's important for us as an organization to hear those other viewpoints and and be able to counter them, like like you did so well, Dre. Even though you may have put down the book, you actually did counter them very very well. So I mean, it, it seems like you got into it enough to be able to to do that, even if it even if it made you angry, which I completely I completely get. But I, I I do feel like we whatever we're reading, even if it's something contemporary, uh, if we can make it through it and take what's best from it and go, you know, and uh, while highlighting the bad things. Thank you, David. Any other discussion on this point? Yes, Simon. Um, question I have for each, each one of you, how to resolve this problem and get to where we want to go, please. Uh, if you have comments, uh, how to uh, overcome the past and the present and create a better future. Right. Well, if, if I could piggyback on that, because I had a similar question um, that I'll throw out and then we'll see if there are any other responses. If not, we'll go on to David Orton and then Lynn. Um, so what, what the conversation was reminding me of um, was a, a talk I went to uh, by the president of a local university decades ago. And I, I don't even remember what, what the topic of, the, of his talk was. He was a remarkable speaker, but he started off by saying that the United States is built on a great paradox where on one hand, you have some of the highest principles of humanity espoused um, you know, by many of the founders, et cetera, et cetera, um, and things that have been dreamed about or only dreamed about were, were really, there were attempts to make them real. So that's one side of the paradox. The other side is the United States was also built on the genocide of one race and the enslavement of another. And, and that happen at the same time, you know, simultaneous and together. And, and it seems to me, and this is something, you know, the questions I think Simon just asked, and I, I ponder a lot, that given that humanity has the capacity to be wonderfully visionary and inspiring and wonderfully cruel, uh, or horribly cruel, I should say, you know, how does one deal with that, with that paradox of human nature? Uh, or maybe it's not human nature, maybe it's something else. Um, so I'll throw that up in the air along with, um, with Simon's related question. And if there are responses, and, and you know, if not, we'll go to David Orton and then Lynn. Or maybe that's just one to meditate on. <laughs> okay. Well, I, 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 now yeah, go ahead, Lynn. Um, like I said, you create a self-fulfilling prophecy, but what occurs to me also is the internet and social media, you know, is so dependent these days. Well, we in this group right here now, me not having even read the stuff, you know, there are certain principles I know with CGS and, and this can go out. This is the media. We are the media. We don't need the social media, the Facebook, the Yahoo. We know these things. And Simon asks, how can we solve this? That's how, Simon, we can solve this by talking to our friends, by just having the energy and the thought in our head, the actual entity of the thought, to, to build the commonality that erases the old dysfunctional ways and the violence part we don't need that anymore and we all know that and many more beside outside this group know that 
But that's my solution, Simon, is to think about it that way and think it into reality. Now, is that too much to ask? I don't think so. I really don't. Yeah. I think well, me, that is actually the way it happens. Yeah. And, and let me just piggyback onto that to remind people, this is a book club. We have other teams working and groups working on the programs, the campaigns, and the other outreach methods to put these into action. So, um, so it's fine to talk about that stuff here, but I just remind people, this is a book club. If folks want to actively work on those other things, we do have the venues to do it, and we could certainly use more muscle in those venues. So everyone's invited to participate in the action that could come out of this. Okay. So just in the interest of including everyone, let me get to David Ott, and then we'll get to Lynn, and we'll change the uh, move on to the next theme. David? I think that understanding street in its historical context uh, in between the first two world wars, and he talks in the end how he was uh, involved in the first world war, and um, his whole book is a reflection on how the leagues don't work, uh, only unions will, and that's why it's union now. But his solution then is for the democracies to unite first, hoping that um, the non-democracies won't unite among themselves and that they gradually will join uh, the union of, of democracies. And that's where I, I wonder whether uh, Street was right on that, uh, whether uh, just uniting the democracies would, would not have provoked the non-democracies to have uh, their own union. And then um, there would be, I think, conflict and violence between the two different kinds, kinds of unions. Um, when I was finishing the book, I was uh, also interested in his proposed constitution. Uh, and of course, he admits that he's simply taking the United States Constitution and rewording it in some ways in order to come up with a constitution for a democratic union. Um, I especially was interested in his uh, his how he would divide the House of Deputies and the Senate for a uh, democratic union. So if you have the book in front of you, if you'd look at page 207 in the, in the abbreviated version, uh, that's where he lists uh, the number of deputies and the number of senators in uh, his proposal. And uh, out of 280 deputies, um, look how many the United States would be a portion, 129. And uh, second would be the United Kingdom in 47, and third would be France in 42. Uh, the rest are pretty much single digits. So I don't know how he thought that would have flown. Uh, even back in the 1930s for the United States, France, and Great Britain to have the vast majority of uh, deputies deputies in such a parliament. And in the uh, Senate for a, a democratic union, he would give the United States 10, uh, United Kingdom 4, and France 4, and all the rest just 2. Uh, again, it's the same problem of how he thought that, that would have been accepted by the other democracies, much less the non-democracies, whether they would join such a, a situation. So the problem of how to allocate um, representatives in such a, a, a world federation or world union is a problem. We've seen um, uh, Joe Schwartzberg's uh, uh, weighted voting situation for the current United Nations, uh, where he combines a weighted vote based on both population and contribution to the, to the UN. Um, and we've also seen another example of a, a model constitution uh, in this book club. So um, those are the, the details that have to be worked out um, based on this idea that we need a union. We need some kind of federation uh, to go beyond the League of Nations and even now to go beyond the United Nations. So I was wondering if anybody else uh, thought that unusual, his his uh, proposed constitution. 
Okay, so responses to that. Lynn, you have a, a response? <laughs> I'd have to say, yeah, that sounds really good, but I'd add to it that there, rather than being represented equivalently with population or or amount of land that you have or something, there should be, since we already have a lot of problems, right? You know, like Yemen, they get a whole lot of extra because quantitatively, they've been so, you know, abused for such a long amount of time. And it should be figured out quantitatively, each country and each representation, how they've been oppressed. And it, which would effectively be creating reparations for blacks, for every all oppressed peoples, Palestinians, for all of them to get an equal weight until we have a common good e exemplifying itself in the in the culture, in that there's much less, you know, a, a starvation, much less, you know, there's a lot better parameters for how people are living their quality of life. Once it's equal, then you can start on an equal basis. Does that make sense at all, David? Well, um, there's gonna be problems no matter how you create representation. If you wanna do it by oppression, some kind of oppression uh, calculus, the problem is how that would work out. How it could ever um, be done. Um, so I don't know whether that, that would be very helpful, but certainly any world federation or world union has to uh, solve the problem that you talk about, Lynn, the, the historical oppression and how to solve it. All right. Thank you. Drea? Just that the breakdown of, you know, how many deputies and senators, like we just need to add a veto power and we've got the UN. <laughs> um, I just, it's appalling, his breakdown. Um, and also uh, a little ageist, that's what really struck me. Like you have to be 25 years in this one, you have to be 30 years old. And so we're excluding young people, which are the next generation, which actually have a lot of um, ideas and thoughts about how, you know, our world should be governed. Um, so those are, those are just the two things to, to add on to that, David. I, I agree, it's absolutely problematic. <laughs> I, as the moderator, the, the gizmo doesn't let me raise my hand, so I'll just jump in and then I see Barat uh, in, in line as well. I mean, r rather than criticize what he wrote, which is really rife for criticism, so I'm not agreeing with it, but I, I think it, it does point out a perennial problem is once you have a model, once you have a set of guidelines and regulations, you just follow them. But to get the people together to draft those guidelines, that everyone has a different idea of what you should do to get to that point. That's the dilemma. You know, it's, it's you know, once we all agree on any constitution, <coughs> even a dictatorial one, okay, great, one, one person makes the rules, great, okay, we all follow that. But how do you get to that? And, and who are the constituencies? You know, is it, you know, I mean, do we have, um, you know, short people are oppressed and, you know, we should give them more votes than tall people, you know. I mean, there's any number of ways you can slice the pie, uh, and I'm saying that facetiously, but, um, you know, it, it, it's that that is a dilemma of informing any group or any movement or anything until you get to the rules. What are the rules by which you make the rules? So it's just a maddening thing. I mean, I don't know that there's any way, a, 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 you know, around it, unless there's a preset thing you come into, like we're all of the same religion. So we'll follow the way this religion does or, or whatever. Uh, but otherwise it's, it's really a challenge, no matter what, you know, no matter what, <laughs> period. End, end of statement, Gail? Um, yeah, I have- oh, I'm sorry, Barat, I had called on you before, then Gail. Go ahead, Barat. Okay, I have uh, two points to make. Uh, one is, uh, some of this conversation, sort of a critique of something that was written in 1940. Uh, the world was very different then than the world we have now. 
And so in, in that uh, respect, our kind of uh, landscape or however you want to describe it, the way the world is, we need to use that as a kind of a basis to come up with a framework. So uh, it, it's probably like beating a dead horse to keep <laughs> questioning and, uh, you know, uh, complaining and, you know, like uh, about what's in the book. Uh, we kind of at a different phase. The other thing I'd like to say is that a lot of these changes or so-called principles in humanity and cultures, I don't think work from the top down. It's not something we kind of form at the top and you know we follow that system. Uh, so many communities, you know, different countries, different cultures have their kind of own way of negotiating uh, what's fair and what's uh, and 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 those kinds of uh, uh, sort of bargaining or uh, how should I say balance. Uh, uh, like in some culture, for example, the, uh, uh, well, like I villages I know in India, like the male uh, becomes very dominant, for example, in, in the local constitution. But on the other hand, the larger structure, namely the government, comes up with uh, uh, right to information, certain laws, and so you need translators where a lot of these local societies are being transformed, where some women now are becoming heads of these village uh, organizations and, and transformation is taking place. Now, this is happening from right from the grassroots at the lower level. And so I feel many of the things we kind of say in principle should be there to start with would be very difficult to achieve. But what could be done is uh, at the local levels, if we are willing to kind of explore the way the dynamics works in relationship, maybe they can build something from you know, ground up rather than from top down. And in order to understand that and get a better hold of it, I really think we need to put more attention on what has happened in the history of United Nations, because United Nations tried to do that, you know, has done it successfully in a number of, uh, of its agencies, not in its uh, overall, uh, uh, you know, uh, functioning, but the relationships on how to work with tribes, how to work with different situations, when there's an epidemic, for example, in, in the way they have negotiated things and gotten people together. So I, I guess I'm not providing any answers, but I'm just simply stating that maybe we have to think differently if you're thinking about wanting to have a one world where we have you know, what would be uh, most desirable than to follow a model or a system. But that's 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 all. Maybe you can comment right. on my thoughts. Thank, thank you. Well, let me let me first um, uh, point welcome Tiziana, um, and just to say, in terms of our overall time frames, we've got a little more than twenty minutes left. Uh, out of that, we were hoping to take a little bit of time to talk about the book and the, the next book, rather, and the um, the questions that I raised before. Um, so we don't have a lot more time for this discussion. Um, I see Gail is next in line, so I, I do want to get her in. And then we had um, Lynn was, was the last one online. And then I had a question that I was saving for Tiziana, not knowing if she would you know, be rejoining us or not. So um, I just want to find out we're constrained on time um, and, and point that out. So Tiziana, I, I'm going to go on with, with the discussion as we've been having. Uh, and then you're welcome to, oh, did she disappear? No, she's here. Oh, okay, she just is, oh, oh, you just moved on my screen. Okay, good. So let me um, get Gail in and then Tiziani are next. 
Well, I think the bottom line question that he's get the straight is getting us to think about is, is it a useful way to go to invite um, all the democracies, however we define them? And that's that's tricky because according to a study, the US is not a democracy, it's an oligarchy. So we have to exclude ourselves. But anyway, to get democracies or at least whoever is willing together to start um, a union, is it, that's the bottom line question. And I think it is a useful question despite all the defects in his book. Right. Thank you. Um... So Tiziana, what we've just been doing is people have been talking about um, what, what uh, grabbed their attention in the book. And then once a particular theme has been discussed, uh, we've all been responding to that. And then we go on to the next theme. So we've been going kind of in an organic way, uh, but um, go ahead, you have the floor. Oh, it looks like your signal is frozen. Okay, can you, um, with, you, your visual is frozen. Can you speak? Oh, get, there you go, okay. Yeah, so uh, thank you for the patience. I'm sorry, I've been struggling for the last hour and I decided to just go by phone. Uh, so hopefully you can hear me and uh, we don't have yeah. problems. Um, I'm sorry I missed the discussion. I would have been very happy to be part of that discussion. These are. Uh, you know, probably some of the most important chapters of Stride uh, uh, in terms of uh, um, this philosophy, its ideas, and why he thought at the time to propose the idea as he proposed it. So um, I don't know if you have discussed to which extent, uh, um, and I apologize if I'm repeating maybe things that have already been said. I think that. Um, here, like it really connects the issue of uh, the relation between uh, equality, freedom, union, and how these three things are really interconnected, and how there can be no true inclusion without these things being part of the dynamics of choices that we make and how we go um, in terms of about creating this uh, world federation. Um, I heard uh, a little bit of the last comment and uh, the idea, okay, what are the democracies and uh, who we invite. Um, I think that um, one important aspect that sometimes is uh, misunderstood um, in terms of just the importance of the concept, not, not in terms of just pride book, is um, what, um, what is uh, really, the what, what is that we are trying to achieve um, in terms of uh, the policy that Stein saw at the beginning as a starting with the American Union and then the failure of the League of Nations, but this beginning of uh, uh, bringing people together beyond the national boundaries. Uh, but the concept that is of time, like uh, the stress of time. Uh, at what point in history do we need to stress what and what are the policies at that moment in history changes? And he says that very clearly. He says what was true at the beginning is not true, was not true at the time of the League of Nations and it will change. So we need always to keep in mind what is the principle, which is what will further. He speaks about freedom, but in a sense that is very emancipatory in terms of uh, uh, bringing each individual to full fulfillment. Uh, so what is the policy that uh, would give us closer to this final state, that is this final state of world federation, in which there is equality, freedom, uh, peace, and all those um, social justice uh, and all those things. So maybe the way to think about it today is we cannot go back to this design, okay, the 15 democracies, what would be the form today to really uh, implement these principles and this idea. And it's very different today, um, but the principle remains the same. Um, so that was one thing I wanted to talk about. And then another little thing I wanted to jump in uh, quickly is, um, I think this really goes at the core of the history of our, of the bigger world federalist movement and despite you know, the difference in uh, different organization and how, um, 
why the movement split at the time and uh, what were some of the misunderstanding and that still, um, I think, uh, part of the discussion, I find often uh, the, um, you know, the classification of strike as being like, why well, this is a, just a partial federation is not inclusive. And instead it was trying to bring the theme of inclusions really uh, in from the bottom up, like the inclusion of the individual per se, how do you guarantee that the individual is included? Not that all, uh, maybe the whole uh, world is included by the individual and no say. So that was the, the tricky part that still remains. Uh, and that is the, at the core of both world federalism and the strike federalism that are the, the same thing through different routes. Um, and um, I think that by now, really, we're at the point where the message of war federalism and the message of strike are really, for the most, overlapping almost, almost the same with some differences in emphasis, I think. But the idea, um, again, what would be this today? What would guarantee uh, inclusion of the individual person as opposed to inclusion of you know, collective groups that, uh, as he says about the history of uh, his own uh, experience, um, always would have the interest of the group at heart rather than the, the individuals and the, the people in it. And then we have to think also, is this enough today? Or we should include them more than just people. We should include the other species. We should, should include the environment. And we should include all these other elements. I think that if Stride were here today, it would definitely also uh, you know, reflect on these aspects uh, as part also of um, the emancipation of the individual in full. In full. Um, so this is a short comment. I'm sorry, um, I wasn't able to connect and I spent uh, quite a bit of time trying to do that. Okay, well, I'm glad you came back. Uh, again, we, we only have a few minutes left. I, I know Lynn has been in the line. So I want to uh, first turn to Lynn and see if, if you have, if you could summarize in a minute or two, whatever question or comment you had, and then Tiziana could respond to that. And I, I was in line after you, and then we'll see if there's anyone else. Um, and then we'll get to the announcements and the wrap up. So um, Lynn, was there anything based on the book that you could bottom line? Um, well, based on what Tiziana is saying, mm -hmm. and this, and this, this, um, this one versus many people, um, something that comes to mind too is someone spoke earlier about uneducated people and are they just expendable since they're uneducated or are they uneducatable and what's the you know the one versus the the goals of the many there's outliers you know there's the serial killers there's all of these things and we don't um we we have to account for how we're going to deal with that including possibly even rogue countries rather than just rogue individuals. So, um, you know, and right now we've got a completely rogue House of Representatives with Kevin McCarthy. And in an instant, he can be kicked off of there. And yet he's been completely defanged from doing anything progressive and he's not trustable in the first place. So it's like, what what do we have in a civilized quote unquote um, democracy here? You know, I mean, we might as well be Israel where they're depending on the Supreme Court and the legislative. They, they don't even have a constitution and they're getting undermined in their situation. Um, okay. So, so in, in the 13 minutes we have left yeah. um, and a few other items, I, I'd like to just allow Tiziana yeah. to respond. I just say the processes maybe yeah. have to be refined, not refined, but fundamentally changed somehow. Okay. I don't know if that's something you have a response to or not, but the floor is yours, Tiziana. Yeah, I think that um, this brings up uh, a thing that was very, very dear to Stride. And in these chapters, he um, he goes deeply into that, but it was something that he also explored before as a journalist for the League of Nations, the role of the expert and uh, versus the common man. 
And uh, strato always pick the position that the expert might be necessary, but the expert has the obligation to uh, make uh, is what he calls his truth understandable to everybody. And then eventually the judgments belongs to everybody. So um, I think that some of the points that were just brought up uh, touch upon that. And I think we have uh, gone probably even further um, along this division between expert and the common person, the participation of the common person and the expert because things becomes more complicated and also because of um, how things have evolved. Um, so bringing back the idea that it, how do we renew democracy when issues are so complicated, but uh, the expert that cannot be like in charge, cannot be uh, thinking, uh, we cannot think of um, the judgment at the end, it always belongs to the community, to everybody. And that there is this responsibility of uh, participation that to strike was always was uh, the main important thing. Great. Uh, David, was that a, a question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, very quickly, I, I wanted to say something positive about Street's proposed uh, constitution in that he begins it with human rights as opposed to the U.S. Constitution where they were amendments. So I think that at least uh, he's starting off with the individual and the rights that all humans should have and then how to go about guaranteeing them. Great. Any comment, Tiziana? No, I just, uh, yes, <laughs> just more of uh, what I was just um, saying earlier on. Um, and I don't know, I wasn't part of the discussion, so I don't know what you guys <laughs> said before. Um, I, I would uh, stress, not just in terms of the Book of Strife, but in general about well, what we're doing as, you know, federalists about, um, you know, uh, the, the future, uh, this um, stressing always this element of inclusion, of inclusion of the person, of equality, and uh, uh, that there is no equality without freedom, and that there is no real freedom without union, that there is always partial freedom without union. And, and so I think that uh, perhaps, um, I don't know if, if the comments were positive, negative, perhaps what we can take out of this book is, um, that that should remain the priority for federalists. Um, and there are rich philosophical, theoretical, and uh, real life empirical foundations for that, that um, are really solid. Great, thank you. I okay. wanna bring up something. Okay, well, we, we're, we're gonna have to wrap up. We're already uh, past the this this I segment. Summarize um, things. So. Yeah, we're gonna have to wrap up at this point. So, um, so Tiziana, I did want to give you the last word if there's anything else that you wanted to say, and then we'll move into the schedule and the next book and all that. No, unfortunately, the only thing I want to okay. say is that I am sorry that I missed the, this discussion. Previous one, I was leaving for Italy and uh, I like to, you know, continue this discussion maybe further in other ways. Um, I will. Um, I came in too late really to, to make a concluding okay. comment apart from uh, what I already said. Okay, well, that, that, that's fine, that, that's fine. Um, so, okay, so let me, um, I, I just wanna, I'm just checking well, it. Quickly, that okay, if you, can, if you can be very brief. Channel yeah. from Tatiana. Great. And that is, um, you know, I think there's something in here called momentum. And once we get on a track, that's the, the the ultimately the right track, okay? That's not so divisive. Then we can create, self-perpetuatingly create the underlying conditions where people in Yemen and people aren't starving, and it, it, there's not all these bad conditions to start with that cause transgenerational um, problems later on. You know, when there's the, when it's really built up that we can create a new momentum. And that would be like a reassuring thought towards unification and common goals. Great, thank you. Okay, 
So Tiziana, I, I, I want to invite you to stay for uh, after this meeting for a brief debriefing if you want to. I'm going to take a minute or two just to do some administrative stuff um, with the group to wrap up the session. Okay. But you're invited to stay, and then we'll 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 debrief a bit at the end. Um, so first, I want to go back. Um, well, well, actually, first let, let's verify the next meeting date. Um, and on, on, we'll go ahead then, as we said at the beginning of the meeting, rather than taking the break because we took the month of November off to have our uh, conference that will roll right into uh, next month, the, um, the next book. So could you, uh, Gail, can you let us know what the date is for that? Uh, and well, yeah. the, the next... Um... It's the second week of February would be February 11, Saturday. And we would go back to our original time of noon to 1.30 um, for our next book, which is Global Governance and the Emergence of Global Institutions for the 21st Century. Now, if we want to skip a month, um, the, first, the, the second Saturday in... Yeah. March. We, 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 March we've already decided on that one. That that one okay, we've already okay. decided. Yeah, yeah. So we, we'll we'll flow right into that. People have got the link. They got the book. Um, and in okay, a moment, great. I will show the table of contents of that. We we have the we have a moment for that. Um, going back to the other question of taking a um, taking a session just among ourselves to reflect on the um, uh, and if you missed the beginning, you missed this discussion. Um, but should we, since each book, each, each segment is half the year, six months, we have two books in a year, should we do what we've been doing and keep five weeks with the person, with the presenter, and then, I'm oh, sorry, five months, and then in the sixth month, uh, meet without the presenter, just on our own to reflect on broader issues and the implications of the book and all that. So we meet every month. Or should we meet uh, with the presenter for four months about the book, have the fifth month um, without the presenter, but among ourselves, and then take a one month break? So those are the two ways to keep the year, the two books in the year, which is what I mentioned at the beginning. So quick show of hands. How many people would prefer to just meet every month in the year without a break? where for five months we're with the presenter, we have five months going into the book with the presenter, and then one month just discussion amongst, our, amongst ourselves, which of course is optional. So if you prefer that meeting every, every month in the year, raise your hand, just a quick show of hands to see if there's a preference. Okay, I'm seeing- What was the opposite of that, Bob? <laughs> the opposite is we have the break, we cut the meetings with the presenter shorter. We have we 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 read the book in four months. Right. We have the fifth month on our own to discuss it, and then have a one month break. That's the opposite. So asking again for the first one that we just go twelve months in a year. You could always take the month off and always see things on the video if you want to. So show of hands again. It looked like that was the majority. Um, okay. It, and, and how many people want to do the other one of reading the book with the presenter for, for, uh, for four months, the fifth month alone, and then a month off? Okay, I see two hands on that one. Okay, well, well, most likely, since many people are not here, we will most likely send out an email uh, to check. Um, at, at it, it, you know, having the meetings as we've had later in the day cuts into people's weekends more so I was imagining we might have fewer people at, at some of these sessions. So we want to reach the whole group. So, okay, fine. So let me say uh, a word or two about the, the next book, uh, which as Gail just said, it's called Global Governance and the Emergence of Global Institutions in the 21st Century. I'm going to share my screen. And just if you haven't seen the book yet, uh, I will show you the book and the table of contents, which you have the link for, and we'll be getting it again. Um, hold on just a moment. Let me bring it up. Okay. okay. It's, it's loading. It'll, okay. There we go. 
uh, share screen. Okay, this is, I just got to move it on my screen. Okay, so this is what the book looks like and I have a thumbs up if you're seeing it. Okay, terrific. So this is what the book looks like. We have so far um, leaned heavily on books that have to do with the history of the movement or that were that that occurred in our history. So to balance things out, um, this is a book hot off the presses. Um, it is a new book out. Um, and un unlike the other books that had one author uh, or in one case, two of them where both were here, this one has three authors who are all um, folks prominent in the field in global governance and international relations. Uh, they're not just academics that hide somewhere and teach and write books. Um, and then just to show you the, um, the structure of it, I'm just going down to the table of contents. Okay, and let me make this a little bit bigger. So it has a number of parts to it. I'm not gonna go chapter by chapter, but just to show you this part one, the background, this is their version of the history of the movement and European integration as well. Um, so that's, that's one chunk. So we will overlap with some of the historical things. Some of this will be familiar. Um, then we move in uh, to the United Nations and UN reform and the various proposals and attempts for that. That's the second section. Then moving down further, uh, you see uh, governance and the management of multiple global risks. So this looks at, at some of the various risks, whether it's the economy, uh, war, environment, et cetera, et cetera, and looking at how global governance is dealing with it now in our current environment um, and what may be proposals for the future. Um, then there's this shorter section uh, they call cross-cutting issues uh, with some problems that, as the title says, cut across the different problems, things like corruption, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then the next part, foundations for a new global governance system. Uh, this is their looking forward and their kind of vision for where things might go and then the conclusions. So uh, this will be our next book. If you're the kind of person that likes to write in your book, you may wanna buy it uh, or do what David did and get it on uh, Reader where you can highlight it electronically uh, or you can just uh, go ahead with the link that we sent you. So, um, so that is the next book. Let me see if I had any other announcements. Um, Oh, as usual, we welcome feedback on how this is working to outreach at globalsolutions.org. Um, if you haven't renewed your membership with us, again, the, the people who you're seeing running this thing, some of them are volunteers, but some are paid. So we want to keep our, our staff intact and keep the lights on. Uh, so your contributions do help with that. So any questions about any of the um, logistical or things before we wrap up and say goodbye? Yes, David. I just to ask Gail if she could uh, kindly resend the link to the book, like as soon, even today, maybe, so that we could get going on it. I'm excited. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Yes, great, great. Yeah, David is one of our chronic students, and I, I can say that because I am as well. So uh, <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll send it today or tomorrow. Great. Yes. I like the part about cross cutting issues in education that, that I oh, yes. did, you know. Everyone can just get educated, and that goes very far sometimes. That is a biggie. That is a biggie, no question. Okay, so, um, oh, uh, Simon? And the time was going to be earlier. Uh, yes, we're going back to our original time, which East Coast time is 12 noon to 1.30, or mm -hmm. for us uh, laid-back Californians, it's 9 to 10.30. Thank you.